All right, all right. Hey, good morning, everyone. A quick word of advice uh, before you are going to speak to a crowd of people. Don't get the shingle shot a couple days in advance. Okay, just throwing that out there. No reason, no reason why I mentioned that. Feeling a little better today, though. All right, um, welcome. We're starting a new series called Family uh, Portrait. Uh, I want to start off by saying whoever you are, however uh, you got here, whatever um, you bring with you when you came, um, I, I, I want to encourage you and say, I think there's something for you. And, and I realize that we're all at different places and we have a bunch of different set of circumstances and some of us are younger, some of us are older, some of us are married or have been married or uh, haven't been married, some of us kids, no kids, you know, the, the whole gamut. I, I understand that. I'm aware of that, but, but I really am confident of this, is that if you and I listen to God, and I, I really do include myself, if you and I listen to God, he's going to speak to us. Um, he's got something for us in his word. And what's more important than hearing from Joel and, uh, you know, critiquing Joel on whatever Google is, uh, on Yelp, you know, whatever, uh, is to just hear from God. And so we're going to, we're going to do that. That's kind of where we're going. So let me just uh, pray and then we'll, um, uh, dive in with a couple questions. Uh, Father, uh, we do want to hear from you now. And so, Lord, just settle our minds and uh, open our hearts, and might we, we be ready, prepared, eager to receive from you, because you are a good God. You are a powerful God. You are the God who made us. You've got a plan for us, and you've got a wisdom that we don't have that we need. And so, teach us. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. First question is what comes to mind when you hear the word family? What comes to mind? Like what images, I should say, pictures, pictures come to mind. Um, you know, I think my generation, uh, some pictures might be family dinners and, um, you know, camps and campfires and, you know, um, you know, by the way, camping always creates all kinds of exciting memories, does it not? You know, because there's usually mosquitoes and there's all kinds of fun things that happen. But um, station wagons, that was a thing uh, back in my day. I'm dating myself. That's okay. Uh, you know, um, whatever, awkward holiday gatherings. Not my family, but just yours. Um, and actually uh, adore my family. But anyway, I think, the, I think the word family might conjure up something different to younger people today. You know, maybe they think of a room filled with people that they're all on their phones, you know, or, uh, and somebody's asleep in, in the corner or whatever, or maybe just busyness when they think of family, it was just overloaded schedules and a lot of to-dos and trying to keep up with everything and, you know, all, all kinds of things. So I just want to start there. And the second question is this, what good examples of respectable, honorable families um, exist in popular culture today? So I need to think about that, all right? Uh, how many of you remember the show, Leave It to Beaver? Leave It to Beaver. All right. I don't. I'm way too young for that. But anyway, uh, way before my time. No, I know you're thinking, yeah, me, me too. I'm just watching the syndicated uh, shows or whatever. But, um, you know, think about the kinds of shows that exist on television, you know, today and have existed. So I did a little research on this because I do think that what we see in pop culture does reflect a little bit of reality. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one or whatever. It's a perfect mirroring or image or whatever, but, but it says something. So I did some research. Here's what I found. In the 1950s, some of the popular shows that depict um, families in that era Okay, so I'm not talking about a show that came out in the 50s, but it's about a family from the 1700s or something like that. No, I'm talking about a family show in the 50s that depicts a family in the 50s, if that makes sense. All right, so in the 1950s, uh, there were shows like Ozzie and Harriet or uh, Father Knows Best, which got me thinking, can you imagine a show being named Father Knows Best in our culture today? Oh, boy, the first... First service thought that was funny, but anyway, um, <laughs> in the 1960s, it was My Three Sons, The Andy Griffith Show, for instance, just some examples. 1970s, we had Eight is Enough, Good Times, The Waltons, 
Happy days. Some of you, mmm, like it's a spiritual experience. Uh, happy days. Mm. Uh, the Brady Bunch, right? Uh, 1980s, you had the, the Cosby Show. Now his real life didn't, you know, whatever. But anyway, but that show was great. And uh, the Family Ties. And then you had other shows that I wasn't allowed to watch, but Dallas and uh, Dynasty and shows like that, right? And then in the 1990s, it was Family Matters and Home Improvement. And uh, everybody loves Raymond, you know, with that sharp dad. And then, uh, I don't know if this qualifies, Beverly Hills 90210, is that? I don't know if that's families, but Roseanne, Ro certainly families. Uh, the Simpsons, you know, great example of families there. Um, I don't know if you're picking up something, but something happened in the 80s where it started to leak these examples of families that were a little bit dysfunctional. And I, it largely was used for a humorous uh, purpose, uh, other than like dramas, I guess, like Dan Dynasty in Dallas or something like that. But for the most part, uh, it's it used for humor. But it was just interesting. Shows that depicted families prior to that really didn't showcase, you know, the goofy dad and, uh, you know, whatever, the kids who were super rebellious and that sort of thing. But, and then I did some more uh, <clears throat> research. Um, interestingly enough, starting in the 2000s, something that I find fascinating happened. All right, so in the 2000s, and I did quite a bit of research on this, there were some family uh, depictions and shows. I guess we'll include Gilmore Girls. Okay, I guess we'll throw that in there. My wife and daughter love that show. Uh, I've never seen this one, Friday Night Lights. Uh, I think that's a family, you know, depicts family. I guess Family Guy, never seen that one before, but uh, that might be. But most of the popular shows in the 2000s were shows like Alias and 24 and Prison Break and uh, Heroes and Lost and things like that. And then in the 2010s, again, not a lot there. You had Modern Family and another show called This Is Us, you know, very intense and whatever. And, and then, I don't know, I haven't seen this one either. Uh, Breaking Bad, is that a family show? Is that, a, is that about a family? Is that, I don't know, but there is a family in there, okay? So I'm not sure if that qualifies. Then the 2020s, again, not much there. Maybe Yellowstone, you know, the high-functioning family there. I don't know. <laughs> I, I've never seen that show, heard it's maybe, okay, I, maybe I should stop talking, but the point is, is this, is that, so not only was a healthy, happy family rarely portrayed um, on television from like 2000 on, but any family, literally any family, it's like at some point we move from, here's depictions of families and their adventures together and the, the lessons learned and all those kinds of things into, aren't families goofy and silly and isn't it funny, into, let's just stop talking about families. We don't want to talk about families because families are kind of not fun to talk about. Nobody wants to watch a show about a family. Here's what I want you to know. We're not going to ignore the family because God doesn't ignore the family. And I believe that God has a plan for the family. And we're going to articulate that plan throughout this series. And it's going to be helpful to us. I want to encourage you to be courageous and brave and, you know, not easily offended. Uh, love isn't easily offended. Um, humble people aren't easily offended. So I just I want to invite you to, to just sit and listen. And will everything directly apply to you? No, but it'll directly apply to people you know and love. And even if you um, are aren't married, you know married people, you can encourage them, even if you don't have kids. You know people with kids, you can bless them and encourage them as well or whatever. So I think this series is important for all of us. You see, the scriptures say that God established the family, all right? So really clearly here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, says this, for this reason I kneel before the Father, I love that language about God, from whom... Every family in heaven and on earth, every spiritual family, every biological family, all, every family derives its name, right? So Henry Ford founded the Ford Motor Company, right? Sam Walton founded the, founded what? Walmart, yeah, that's right. Uh, Walt Disney founded Disney, yeah. Steve Jobs founded, help me out, Apple, yeah. Uh, Larry Page founded Google, correct? Uh, Jeff Bezos founded Amazon. Mark Zuckerberg founded, yeah, Facebook or Meta. And then Elon Musk founded 
Yeah, SpaceX and Tesla and all kinds of fun things. All right, so, <clears throat> but there is only one true founder of the family, and that is God. And it's interesting because God's plan wasn't, all right, <clears throat> we're just going to have like human beings on this planet, and they're going to live largely disconnected lives. They're going to be independent. You know, It doesn't matter if they're faithful or not. They're going to be self-focused, self-gratifying, self-indulgent. And they're just going to take up space and breathe in oxygen and use up resources. And they're simply here to coexist. And they will, they will multiply. They will have kids. But there, there will be nothing beyond that, right? Like that could be said of humans. Friends, that's more like the animal world. And humans aren't like animals. And God has a plan for people. And the family was his idea. It was his design. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 4, Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy. Timothy is pastoring a church in Ephesus, and he's talking about how to take care of aging widows. Let's read the scripture. It says this, but if a widow has children or, or who? grandchildren, which is interesting to me based on what he says next, let them first learn, these children and grandchildren, to show godliness, here's what a godly life looks like, to their own household and to make some return to their parents. In other words, pay them back. Their parents and apparently their grandparents, <laughs> Help them out in their time of need, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. In other words, we have a God-given responsibility to care for our families, except for the difficult people. Just kidding. No, including the difficult people. And I know this gets really, really difficult and nuanced, and I get all that. I just want us to understand the overarching principle here. And then a few verses later, he says something really, really strong. You see, God, the creator of the family, has some really strong things to say about the family. Look what he says through Paul. He says, but if anyone does not provide for, does not care for his relatives. Now, I don't think that includes second cousins, but anyway. And, uh, and especially for members of who? His household, their own families. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's not that they just don't believe in the Lord, don't believe in God, don't believe in Jesus, but they like are against. You know, it's like beyond. I don't, I don't even know exactly what that means, but they're worse than an unbeliever. But it's very strong language intentionally. The Lord could have left that out, that part out, but he didn't. He says, listen, you've got to take care of each other. If you can't take care of your own family, I mean, something has gone seriously, seriously wrong. And yes, disclaimer, disclaimer. Yes, there's a time where we can take care of our family. We need help when we need all kinds of things. Yes, we all understand that. Again, the principle here is to care for your family. One of the ways that godliness is expressed is through the caring of our families. 1 Peter 3, 7. Let's take a look at this one. Just setting a tone here. Isn't this fun? Uh, it says this, in the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives. All the wives are like, hallelujah. And then treat your wife with understanding. In other words, be thoughtful, be considerate, listen, you know, that sort of thing. As you live together. That's a good thing for a husband and wife to do, live together. Okay, so she may be weaker than you. Hold on. This does not fit the narrative of the 21st century, you know? Really talking about physically weaker. And there's like maybe a couple of you women who are like, not me, I'm stronger than my husband. It's like, okay, we can arm wrestle right now if you want. If, you know, he's really talking about physical strength. In other words, your wives are vulnerable without you. That's kind of the point. I don't know if you've noticed, but throughout the millennia of human history and every culture, Guess who they don't send to the battlefield first? Let's put the women and children out there first. No, the men go first, and they fight for the lives of their wives and children. They're worth dying for. So don't be all offended when it says weaker. It's dressing the husbands. But she is your equal partner in God's gift of new 
life. Treat her as you should. Now, here's the point I wanted to make. So your prayers will not be hindered. What in the world is that? Why not just treat her well? Be considerate. Protect her. Be understanding. Then he adds this little line. Here's why. Because if you don't, God doesn't want to hear what you have to say. And I don't know if we've thought about that before, but I think some of us just kind of feel like, oh, God's always obligated to listen to everything I say. Uh, No, he's not. In fact, he, he tells us he won't listen to certain prayers. He refuses to even listen, let alone respond with yes or no. It's like, no, 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 no. See, the, the, the bigger principle here is that our family relationships are also connected to our relationship with God. A godly life looks like a life that cares for your family. And this shouldn't surprise us, right? We see this kind of general principle in Scripture. One day Jesus asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, well, the greatest commandment is this, to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says this, and the second is, what does he say? Second is what? Is like it. I know you didn't ask for this. This is like a bonus. But the second greatest commandment is what? It's like the first. It's like it. In other words, we can't disconnect the two, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And we see that in Scripture, like 1 John 4, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Now, talking about a spiritual family there in that context, but again, the principle applies. There is a link between our relationship with God and our relationship with others, and especially our relationship with our family, our church family, and our biological family. But even though this principle is very, very clear throughout Scripture, it doesn't mean it's easy, right? Because I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that many of your greatest joys um, are in the context of your family, Somebody who encouraged you, somebody who believed in you, somebody who said, I'm proud of you, somebody who said, I love you. But also, some of your greatest pains are connected with something that happened, somebody said something, somebody didn't show up, somebody whatever in your family. And that's the truth. The late comedian George, George Burns once said this, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city right? I love my family in Des Moines. Um, Isn't that funny? But some of us can relate. But we are impacted by our family. We're bound to our families. We have obligations to our family. How would you describe the general state of families in America today? Good? Getting better? Healthier? Stronger? Because we keep investing more, by the way. We, We keep, right? We keep literally investing More information, more podcasts, more conferences, seminars, books, more uh, counselors, family therapists. I mean, these things, a lot of these things didn't exist like, you know, 100 years ago. We invest more programs, more money, more. And so all these families in America, haven't you noticed they're getting stronger and better and better and better? I don't think they are. Now, I'm not saying that. Back in the 50s, everything was perfect, and everybody lived this idealized, you know, wonderful family. That's not it at all, okay? Families have kind of always been been a mess. In fact, we're going to see in the scriptures that the first family was a bit of a mess, okay, to say the least. But the point is this. I think it would be tough to argue that families are better off today than they were 30 years ago, let's just say. In general, in general, okay? Imagine one day... You notice a couple of small cracks in the drywall, in the sheetrock of your home. So you call the drywall repair person, and they come out and repair it, and they do a great work, and you say, thank you very much. You pay them for it. And then a couple weeks pass, and you notice there's cracks again, only these cracks are longer and deeper. You're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe. So you call that person, they did a good job last time. You call them, they show up, you know, you pay them, they do great work. I mean, these are, they are professional. I mean, they know what they're doing. They've got the right tools, all that kind of stuff. A couple weeks pass. A third, a third time, 
There's cracks. They're deeper. There are more of them. It's a spider web. It's just like, you're like, what is going? And then it starts, you begin to think, wait, maybe this drywall repair person doesn't know what they're doing. Maybe they're cutting corners. Maybe they're not using good materials. Maybe they're not doing it right. So you call them up and you're a little bit in a huff, you know, like you're just like a little bit upset and you're like, hey, I know, look, this is the third time here. I still got those stinking cracks. They're not repaired right. What's going on here? And they say, okay, you know, calm down, settle down here. Why don't you call somebody to have uh, to inspect your home? So you're like, okay. So you have you call an inspector up, and they show up at your house, and they they look at it. And after inspecting your house, here's what they tell you: I found the issue. You can call the best drywall repair person on planet Earth, and they won't be able to solve your problem. And you say, why not? And they say, because you don't have a problem with your drywall. You have a problem with the foundation of your house. And as long as that foundation is unstable, as long as that foundation's a mess, it doesn't matter how much spackle you put over those cracks. You guys, this is an illustration of exactly what we do today. Families are a mess. We throw a little spackle on it. Little counseling, a book we read, some insights. We even changed some behavior for a time. And then, boom, there are the cracks again. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And the truth is, we can go to the best human wisdom, the best human advice, the best human tips for a stronger family, but we need to address the foundation. You see, God created the family. He designed it. He established it. He invented it. It starts with him. So I'm going to say some things that, um, surprise, you might disagree with or push back on, and that's fine. But I just hope you have a biblical reason for doing so. We're going to try to interpret a couple scriptures here um, as clearly as we can, you know, and uh, understand the principles behind them, at least in the brief amount of time that we have. This message, by the way, just serves as kind of a foundation, and a, as it were, to the other messages that will come out of this series, right? But, so there are things, in other words, there are things that I won't say that you're like, why didn't you bring out this? Why didn't you bring out this? Why you because those messages are probably coming, or we just don't have time for everything, okay? Because there's a lot there to say. But uh, anyway, we're just going to give some fundamental information here, and hopefully that encourages you. And, uh, but we live in a world where families are, um, you know, they're, they're taking a hit. They're not doing so great. Some, some are doing well, some of yours. Everybody in our church, awesome, perfect, holy, wonderful. But in other churches, those churches have people, ooh, not so good. So you can encourage them by the things that you learn um, from God's word. All right, so let's pick it up in the uh, first uh, page of scripture um, in Genesis chapter 1. So this is literally millennia before God even gave his people the Ten Commandments, the law. Right, So this is long before, like right from the get-go, uh, he says some things about the family, the first family and every corresponding family. This is his design. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Let me just read this through. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That's important. So that they may, this is also important, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind, wasn't an accident, it was part of his design, in his own image. There it is again. In the image of God, there it is again. He created them. Male and female, ooh, boy, that's a testy today, but anyway, uh, ooh, uh, he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, um, be fruitful, ooh, this is important too, and increase in number, fill the earth, 
and also this is important, subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living creature that moves on the ground. So we have this like biblical picture of a family, God creating people, and he's got a purpose for them and, and a plan for them, and we're going to unpack some of what that is, just some of what that is. All right, three purposes for the family that God has designed. Number one, according to this text, is that God designed the family for the purpose of, this is going to be surprising, reproduction. Yes, the first commandment given to Adam and Eve, given to humanity, was literally the first command from God is what? Be fruitful and multiply. And all the husbands said, amen. All the wives are like, oh my, you know, and, uh, but that's what we have in scripture. And uh, there we go. And so you got a husband and a wife, and this is how this happens Boy, this is going down an interesting path. And there's, um, there's sex involved. Let's just say it. There's sex involved. And this is the means by which God produces more people. In other words, when he says, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, he's basically saying, make babies. Reproduce little people. And those little people will grow up to be larger people, you know? And this is what God's plan is. Now, Psalm 127 Verse 3, one of my favorite verses, says this. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a, help me out, reward, good, from him. I try not to have too many trick questions. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Children are a what? Gift and a reward. Children are a gift and a reward. Children are a gift and a reward. Will you say that with me? One, two, three. Children are a gift and a reward. That's right. They are a heritage, or in other words, an inheritance. They are a blessing from God. Do you agree with that? Or are your thoughts about children a little different? Um, maybe you see your kids that way, but not other people's kids. Maybe you see other kids as a blessing, but not so much your kids. Don't look at anybody right now, by the way, okay? (laughs) It's bad timing. Is this how you see your kids? Because this is how God sees kids. They're a gift. Gift. Now, the thing about gifts is I can find something to be valuable and give it to you, but it means nothing to you unless you find it to be valuable. It will not feel like a gift to you until you also find it to be valuable. Welcome to 2024, where God says kids are valuable, and our culture says sometimes when you feel like it, when they work with your career plans and they work with you financially and, you know, when they do all the things that you want them to do, when it works out and their nose doesn't run and, you know, like after the diaper stage and then, then they start becoming gifts maybe for a time and then they turn 13 and then they're not gifts then and then they're a gift again when they're 19 and then they're not a gift when they know everything when they come back from school. And then they're a gift when they have their own kids again. And then, right, isn't this a little bit, I mean, I'm being facetious, but isn't this a little bit how we see kids? Uh, Meaning in our culture? There was a time when um, Joy and I didn't know if we'd ever be able to have kids. And uh, I think many of you know, um, we got married young, and um, uh, I mean, legally, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> like, are you from Appalachia? Uh, no. Uh, she was, uh, ni- and I apologize, you're from Kentucky, but uh, we, uh, she was 19, I was 21. Anyway, um, and a uh, couple, couple years in. Surprise, she was pregnant. And, oh, whoa, I didn't plan that one. And, um, but this is exciting, and the, the baby's growing, and you go in for the doctor's visits, and 
you're starting to sort through the names and, you know, you're kind of getting used to this idea and you're sharing with your friends and family. And then at 17 weeks, no heartbeat, no sign of life. And Joy had to immediately go into emergency surgery. And medical stuff, mumbo jumbo, uh, really um, unusual set of circumstances. But um, our baby didn't make it. And um, then we, we got, when I say we, she, Joy got pregnant again. And, uh, and then that baby didn't make it. And, so, and I'm just sharing this with you, not so you feel bad for us, but I want to identify with some of you who have experienced that too. And it's hard. Guess what? It's hard even when you didn't plan for it. And uh, so we didn't know. And, but then third time apparently is a, is a charm for us. That's when, when Nathan was born. And we, we named him Nathan. Um, intentionally, because his name means gift of God. Children are a gift of the Lord. Elizabeth, by the mean, way, means God's promise. Children are a heritage. They're a reward. They're a blessing. They are not a nuisance. They are a tax deduction, but they're not only that. <laughs> they're not a hassle, you guys. They're not. They're a gift. And they're a gift from our creator. And you either believe that or you don't. I mean, that's kind of what it comes down to. You either, and why do I say that? Because so many people come up with reasons why we shouldn't have kids. They're too expensive. They're too restrictive, too limiting. Uh, in fact, somebody just a couple days shared with me, a couple days ago shared with me that they overheard a coffee shop barista say this, that they'll never have kids because they admitted they're too selfish. This, the barista said, uh, like, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and kids get in the way of my plans. And uh, so I'm never going to have kids, you know. And that doesn't sound like somebody who believes that kids are a gift. Does this make sense? I'm just trying to make it really clear, really obvious, because we hear these messages over and over again. They're too difficult. Uh, I'm not healthy enough, wealthy enough, wise enough. Now, sometimes, yes. I mean, if I mean, there are circumstances, extreme. You know, it's like, well, don't have kids. The point is, is kids are a gift, and they should be seen as such. And fruitfulness is a wonderful thing. And it's being obedient to God's, First command. Now, obviously, can everybody have kids? No. And I would say, yeah, there are some occasions for people super unhealthy that it probably, you're addicted on some drugs, like it's not a great plan to have kids, right? But I know that every kid that is conceived, I'm using that word carefully and intentionally, is a gift from God. Human life. Human life. Um, be fruitful. Increase in number. All right. Let's keep going. Hopefully this next one is a little lighter. All right. God uh, designed the family for the purpose of replication. So not reproduction, but replication. What do I mean by that? Well, he says, let's make mankind in our what? Image. In our likeness. Right? So... Every human being has a soul. This isn't a Christian thing, religious thing. Every human being has a soul and is an image bearer of God. And also, of course, every human being is connected to a biological family. But the entire human race is part of an extended family, but the entire human race is made uniquely. People are not animals, we can learn, like the scriptures say, you can learn some things from animals, you know, like be more like the ant because they work hard, you know, or uh, mount up with wings like what? Eagles, you know, or whatever. So there are depictions like that, but at no point are people, humans, and animals on equal turf. And, and when we get that messed up, everything messes up, Okay. And so like a mirror, a mirror reflects 
the object in front of it. And as image bearers of God, we are to reflect the Lord. So the reason, to go back to the first point, the the reason why we have children, God's not saying you should have Make babies because we need more people on this planet who physically look like you, right? And that's no offense because you guys are all beautiful and wonderful and amazing, okay? What he's saying is have babies with the goal that they look like me. They're image bearer of God. The purpose of having kids is not to have kids who look like you, but to have kids who look like Jesus. That's the goal. The purpose of having children is not to have kids who replicate your image, but who replicate the image of God. Not who spread your fame and your family line and your whatever, but who spread the fame of God. It's not to carry on your awesome legacy, but it's to carry on the legacy of their creator. That's the goal. Does it always work out perfectly? No, but that's that's the goal. And so when I'm talking about replication, I'm really talking about looking increasingly more like Jesus. So we get into discipleship language and all kinds of things there. Let's move on to our last point. Number three is that God designed the family for the purpose of cultivation. Now, why am I using the word cultivation? One, because it ends with Asian, like reproduction and replication, okay? That's the big reason. But also this, think about a farmer. Farmer cultivates a field. They work it, they plant it, they till it, they prepare it, they weed it, they irrigate it. They do all this stuff. Why? So that field becomes fruitful and uh, produces a harvest, a a crop. And this is important. So you've got to cultivate it. In other words, cultivation leads to flourishing. And this is sort of what we see in the text, right? Make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish. Like there's an order to this thing. Uh, So that they would uh, increase the number... Uh, fill the earth, verse 28, and subdue it, rule over it. In other words, govern it, take charge of it, be responsible for it. God created people to, in a sense, rule on God's behalf under God's rule because God is ruling. And humans are to demonstrate that in creation. The purpose for the family includes really crazy things like structure, like order, like organization, like a way to uphold that order, right? And when this doesn't happen, families become dysfunctional, right? And when societies don't operate this way, they become broken, and chaotic, and anarchy reigns instead of beauty and goodness and wisdom. And so in healthy families, what do you find? You find flourishing, because there's cultivation happening. You, there's a dominion, a ruling over, a subduing, an order. There's now belonging. There's protect, protection. Not everybody's just like, oh, you're on your own. Good luck. You know, there's production. There's contribution. Members are playing vital roles. Here's another way of summarizing what I'm saying. As families flourish, civilizations flourish. The connection is direct. And I want to make that point, and you might say, well, that's so obvious. Of course, that's how it works, because civilizations are just made up with a bunch of families, right? And, um, and uh, I mean, even people who aren't married or are single or d- widowed or divorced or what, any number, of, like they still have parents, they probably still have siblings, they probably, I mean, there's still family involved at every, every level. So this seems super obvious, But actually, it's not super obvious in our culture because we keep hearing things like, I just want to do what I want to do, and it's not going to impact anybody else. That is not how society works. (laughs) Everything we do affects everybody else. We might not see it in the moment, but it certainly does. The way we live impacts our neighbors. The way our, our family operates impacts our neighbors, our friends, our church family, our other family members. I mean, it's, it's, it's connected in that way. So in that sense, as families flourish, societies flourish. As families crumble and dissolve and break down and decay, 
societies crumble and fall and break down and decay. And that's what we routinely see. In fact, we see that in the first family, right? Um, Genesis chapter 3, we got sin and rebellion and corruption entering into the world. The world now becomes um, uh, still good in its own way, but now broken, contaminated, and uh, essentially sin ruins everything good that God makes. So then Satan attacks our first parents, Adam and Eve. Remember that? And then uh, Adam neglects his role to protect his wife, and he's just kind of standing there like a goober. And then Eve accepts the enemy's lies and falls for the enemy's deception because the enemy's super crafty, and consequently there are massive world-changing implications and complications right? Isn't that what we see? Okay. And so this is this, like right from the get-go, the first family, Adam and Eve. Then they start having kids. And their firstborn was a son named, anybody know? Cain. That's right, Cain. And Cain is a rancher and he's a keeper of the sheep, all right? And then the second born is, is also a son named Abel. And, uh, and Abel is not a rancher. He's a farmer. He's a worker of the ground. And it should be noted that both of them now have a sin nature, as we all have. And anyway, somehow the law of God is written on their hearts because Cain and Abel bring a sacrifice as an expression of worship to God. Neither of them come empty-handed when it comes to worshiping God, which is a lesson for all of us. So this is a good thing. They both bring something in their hands. The problem is what's in their hearts. And what we see is that Abel has a good heart, and Cain apparently has a corrupt heart. God, therefore, doesn't accept the offering from the corrupt-hearted Cain, because you know what God looks at? The heart. That matters to him, the motivation, right? And so uh, he's punished for that. Well, uh, Cain is really upset. I mean, really mad. And he takes it out on his brother Abel. And in a fit of rage, Cain murders his brother Abel. We're talking about the first two kids (laughs) born, right? And so, um, not a great start to the first family, right? There's murder happening. Some of you are like, man, my family's not so bad, right? This is Adam and Eve's kids. It's the, Abel is the first martyr, Cain is the first murder in history. And the point is that God has a, a plan to bless your family, but Satan also has a plan to destroy your family. And so you got to choose whose plan you're going to embrace for you and your family, And the other point is just to say that the decisions were made prior to you. Adam and Eve's decisions impacted Cain and Abel because now they have a sin nature. You guys tracking with this? So our decisions impact others. And when Cain now murders his brother, you know what he's not thinking about? He's not thinking about, uh, well, Abel's not going to grow up and get married and... uh, you know, um, have kids of his own, and like none of that's happening. Not going to have grandkids, not going to have great-grandkids, not going to have great-great-grand... I mean, they lived a long time back then. He's not, that's not happening. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing that Cain isn't thinking about uh, prior to killing his brother is uh, how mom and dad are going to take it. And you can imagine Adam and Eve being just crushed, immense pain. And he's also not thinking about his own children who will never know their good uncle, Abel, He's just so mad. He just, he just wants to take it out on, on Abel, and, and so he just gets rid of him. The point is, is that Cain makes decisions that have generational implications, and this is how life works. In fact, do you remember what happens after Cain murders his brother Abel? The Lord confronts him, and the Lord knows what he's up to, and the Lord knows what he's done, and the Lord knows where he is and all that stuff. <clears throat> but the Lord approaches uh, Cain and asks him, Hey, Cain, do you know where your brother Abel is? And Cain says this, I don't know. Am I my, does anybody know what he says? Am I my brother's keeper? And ironically, the answer is yes, Cain, you are. You are your brother's keeper. 
You were to be your brother's protector, encourager, defender, but instead you're your brother's murderer. You see, God made us in such a way that we operate together and we don't see it in the moment, but every decision we make has an effect on not just us, but on other people as well. And these decisions stack up and they have generational impact. Have any of you experienced that in your own family? Like a decision your parents made or your somebody made or somebody up the line from you, a grandparent or whatever, and it impacts you to this day? I think all of us can think of that, right? In Exodus 20, 12, this is the Ten Commandments. The Lord says this, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, I used to think that meant, okay, honor your parents, because if you don't, uh, you're going to fall off a cliff, you know, and die. But actually, in the context of the Ten Commandments, God is establishing a nation, a new family, as it were, the family of Israel, the nation of Israel. And uh, what I think he's saying is, I am giving you this land. And I want you to know that I build high-functioning, flourishing societies on healthy families. And as the family unravels, so will your society, so will the culture in which you live, and it will have devastating consequences. Do we see that in our culture today, yes or no? And this is not to, um, and if you're a single person with kids, God bless you. In fact, we want to bless you. We want to care for you. We want to protect you. We, we, we think you're a hero for being here and you know, all these kinds of things and, and wanting to do the right thing and honor God and all these things. But statistically, poverty rates quadruple in single-parent homes versus two-parent homes in our our culture. I mean, it's it's worth hell. I mean, there's a whole list of problems. I won't need to get, but you can see the impact. You can see the impact. Families matter, you guys. They matter not just for you, not just for your kids, not just for your parents, your grandparents, your grandkids. They matter to, to all of us. So here's my question as we wrap up. Whose wisdom, whose instruction are you going to choose to build your family on? Do you value children like God values children? Do you see them as gifts to be stewarded, to be raised, to be invested into, to be loved, to be challenged, to be disciplined when necessary so that they might flourish? The family is a big deal to God. It's a building block of society. It's a sacred thing. And so let's just raise our level of appreciation for the family. Let's begin to see the family as God sees the family. Let's refuse to settle for me- mediocrity. Let's admit that maybe the world's ways aren't the best ways. Maybe God's got a better plan. And if we choose his plan, let's see what he does and the blessing that comes from it. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We needed to hear from you today. Um, I know you are speaking to me, and I pray that you have spoken to many. We are blessed to know you. Your word is a blessing. It challenges us. It confronts us. It redirects us. But in the end, it equips us. It encourages us. It comforts us, and it blesses us. We need that instruction. We need that direction. Thank you, God. I pray that this church would be filled with families that are flourishing, that are healthy, that are fully devoted to you. God, we know that we're not perfect and far from it, and your grace is sufficient. And we know that every person in here has their own set of challenges. But I pray that you would minimize the whisper of the enemy's voice that would seek to discourage and dissuade and disrupt. Instead, all of us would feel encouraged by the truth that you give us. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys, our God loves it when we sing with hearts that love him and are um, hungry for him, that crave him, that want to worship him. So we're going to close with a song. Everybody on your feet, and we'll uh, wrap up with this worship song.